Welcome, welcome, welcome to the drama panel. I'm Robin Miles. I'm your moderator for today. Um, I am mostly an audiobook narrator producer, but I'm your basic garden variety actress as well. That's our common thread. Um, I have a background in improv, so I made all these notes because I knew exactly how I wanted to open things. And then Dana started to talk about her book. And like any good improv artist, I started to take notes and said, gosh, that was really interesting. So I'm going to try and take us down a path that integrates a little bit of the subjects that she was talking about. Because obviously, you're a room um, full of teachers. The world's rock stars, they just don't know it yet. <laughs> they will. Um, and two of the things uh, that she said, I'm just going to preface this before I go into introductions, um, mentioned testing overkill, which I'm sure uh, elicits a great response from all of you, and adult collaboration. And so uh, being adults, we're going to try and maybe collaborate a little bit on our drama and theater panel. Um, let me introduce everybody we have today. Michael Sokoloff. Um, I'm sorry, Michael. I do this every time when I first met you. I did that today, too. Michael Sokolov, in the middle, is a writer who has written a book called Drama High. Um, there's a lot more information in your uh, programs. And we're going to try and maximize our time for talking. So um, I'm going to introduce everybody so that we can get right to the heart of our conversation. Um, to his left, we have Lee Fondowski. Fondakowski, excuse Mr. me. Syllable. It's okay. mm -hmm. Mr. Syllable. Mr. Syllable. Mr. Syllable. It's bad actress, bad actress. <laughs> um, who is one of the authors of The Laramie Project and The Laramie Project 10 Years Later. Um, last but not least, to my left is Ken Ludwig, who you may know from Lend Me a Tenor, Fame and Crazy for You. And he has written a book called How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare. So we do have a great group of collaborators, um, an actual play author and play author, plays and musicals, um, and someone who's been in, a, in an observing position um, of drama being taught in a classroom very, very successfully. So to start, um, I'll just give you a little background. Uh, this summer, I was sent copies of all three of the books. Um, and I read through them, found them to be fascinating, and also found quotes that really um, spoke to the heart, I think, of drama and teaching and children's needs. Um, the first one is actually from Michael's book, and I'll use that just to sort of open the discussion. Human beings, it is often said, are hardwired for narrative, and theater can tap into the brain's circuitry in a way nothing else does. Does that resonate with any of you out there? Yes. Absolutely. I thought so. I had a feeling I might be preaching to the converted today. <laughs> um, one of the things that I think everybody's been grappling with is CCSS standards, what's being asked of us and our children in the classroom. I'm a mom. I have a 12-year-old. Um, and I volunteer in the school systems as well. Um, I'd like to just open up a little bit with the idea of listening and speaking as skills that we can teach, that, that we can bring out in our students, in our kids, in our population, um, civil discourse being a dead animal. Maybe we could resurrect. Um, <coughs> and Ken's book speaks right to it, how to teach your children Shakespeare. And if I may, I may read a, a quote from Ken's book. He says, to know some Shakespeare gives you a head start in life. And so Shakespeare articulates emotions that help children understand the stresses of their daily lives. Can you speak a little bit to that? Sure, What thank they can you. get out of that? Absolutely. Um, you know, Shakespeare is unique in our culture. And N nothing speaks to us the way Shakespeare does, and we all, we don't always know that. I really I come here with a mission. I'm a playwright by by trade. What I do for my living is I'm a playwright, but but my passion has been Shakespeare since I was a kid, and and my passion in this book is to try to tell people, look, don't be afraid of it. People think that Shakespeare's difficult be they children, be they adults. I'll bet you there's lots of people in this room who don't want to admit it. Uh, and uh, all, uh, most of my friends and, 
and children feel this way immediately, that Shakespeare feels too challenging. It feels like, how can I possibly get past this language? So the op and Midsummer Night's Dream is a great play to open with with children because it's full of the fairy world and joy and it's funny. And what are the opening lines of Midsummer Night's Dream? Now fair Hippolyta our nuptial hour draws on apace. Four happy days bring in another moon, but oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. Well, most people hear that and say, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> no, you know, it's fine to say, oh, we're all highfalutin, and it sounds like it's, oh, we should know that. But what I talk about in the book, and this answers this question, is wh what I talk about in the book is taking something like that and demystifying it. When I teach kids, and I teach my own kids, this started with me teaching my own daughter, Shakespeare, when she came home, from first grade and spouted a lot of Shakespeare, I thought, aha, I can do this, is what does that mean? Now fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws on apace. There's a man standing on stage, his name is Theseus, he's the king, he, he's the Duke of Athens, and he has his bride next to him, and her name is Hippolyta because she's the queen of the Amazons, and her name's Hippolyta. So let's take the first part, now fair Hippolyta, now my dear, our nuptial hour draws on a pace. Nuptial <coughs> is a word that has to do with weddings. Draws on is coming a pace, is coming quickly. Now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws on a pace. We're about to get married. Four happy days bring in another moon. You told t time by the moon, as the moon waxed and waned, you knew what day you were in. Four days away from our marriage, four happy days bring in another moon. But oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. He wants to get to the wedding bed. He <laughs> wants to get married. Now, when you teach those two lines to a child, you have so enabled them. You have so opened doors. You've given them freedom to have a discourse to s and to be proud of what they've done. Because Shakespeare sounds like it's going to be difficult. But once you open up the world of Shakespeare by knowing what each word means, and then memorizing first one line, and then a second, and then a third. So what the book does is it takes 25 passages from Shakespeare and says, these are the ones you should memorize with your children. And they should memorize them, and they can do it. You stay one chapter ahead of your kids, mm -hmm. and you can <laughs> teach them. And the children you teach, you teach them how to learn this language of Shakespeare. And suddenly, <coughs> Shakespeare being the root of the, our greatest literature in the English language and our greatest drama in the English language, you've opened up the entire world of literature to them. So now you can listen. Now you can speak. You become a, a member of our literate society. And it's easy to do. And that's what you should do. That seems to me what's the root of this, this whole business we're at at Penguin Random House. There was a, a moment earlier when we were talking about listening. Um, Shakespeare, uh, as I think most of us would agree, is not really meant to be taken in through the eyes. It's meant to be taken in through the ears. And you were talking earlier about some resources for listening skills, uh, recordings. Recordings. There are so many great recordings out there. I, I was saying to Robin, I was really lucky. When this book came up, I, 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 name dropping 101, I called a friend of mine. His name is Derek Jacobi, the greatest uh, Shakespearean uh, actor living. But he happens to be a very good friend of mine. He said, look, would you, as a favor to me, record the passages from this book on tape so that people because the important part about teach, one of the tricks about teaching children Shakespeare is being able to hear it and imitate those sounds. So he recorded on the website, the Random House website for this book, is Derek Jacobi reading these passages. But there are other resources. There are CDs. These days, there's just live streaming. You can get RSC recordings. Just go on Amazon and put, you know, essential Shakespeare recording CD. And then your kids 
the, your kids, and, and you know, we have a, a, a wide variety of, 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 of uh, uh, teachers here in the sense of what ages they teach, because I was talking to a bunch of people earlier, and some are elementary, some are middle school, some are later, but you know, you can start this anytime. You want to introduce them through tapes and things to, and through movies, the movies you can show but most of all through the language and through talking to them. And you can start them as early as I did with my daughter in first grade. And by the end of first grade, she must have known five major speeches. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where ox slips and the nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with eglantine. There sleeps Titania some time of the night, lulled in these flowers with dances and delight. And there the snake throws her enameled skin, weed wide enough to wrap a fairy in. In, and with the juice of this, I'll streak her eyes and make her full of hateful fantasies. There's the whole story of Midsummer Night's Dream in those eight lines. And my daughter could do it, who is no extraordinary kid, who could, could spout those <laughs> lines. Don't tell her I said that. <laughs> could, could spout, she's now in college. She could spout those lines within about six weeks of, of tackling that, that passage. That was the first one we did. So there's lots of resources out there to learn Shakespeare. I'm crazy on the subject, but I think it, oh, for your kids, I don't know how many, how many people here do get a chance to teach, teach Shakespeare to their kids. A few. That should be everybody. It should be everybody here. I was talking to Antoinette before, one of the teachers here, and she was saying how this stuff gives, the, the, these, this literature gives you, a, the kids are at a, at a branch in their tree, and what road are they going to take? And, and, and this will get them on the right road. Everybody should teach their kids some Shakespeare. Mm. Um, I'm also a former Shakespeare teacher, so I, I'm, in, I'm living in the same boat. Um, and I wanted to bring in a little bit more of the perspective. Lee's working uh, with the Laramie Project is very, very contemporary. And if I may start off with a quote from the introduction to the Laramie Project. By paying careful attention to people's words, one is able to hear the way prevailing ideas affect not only individual lives, but also the culture at large. That's not so far away, really, I think, from what Ken is saying with Shakespeare. But if you would speak to that from, from your arena more specifically. Uh, sure. I, w I was very struck by uh, just uh, listening versus speaking. I think you know, one of the reasons why I think the Laramie Project resonates with young people is because it is ordinary speech. We're de we record the people in conversation, then we edit it and present it as drama. And what we're always looking for is the poetry of the vernacular. That, that we trust that in that conversation, when someone's speaking passionately about something that, that they've been through or something that they care about, that they reach these levels of poetry. Uh, just in their ordinary speech, and uh, part of part of uh, you know the roots of this work is Anna Devere Smith, which we talked about a little earlier, and you know Anna Devere Smith uh, came from the premise that if she recorded people's pauses, their ums, their uhs, the way they stumbled over language, um, that she would in the in their words, she would find a character. And I think that that proved to be true in her work, and that proves to be you know, true, true in our work. When I go to see productions of The Larry Project, I would swear that the kids had met the people. Because from the words of the ordinary people, I see as if those people are in the room with them. And so the power of ordinary speech to become drama, I think, is, is, is very real. Wonderful. Um, I'll kick this over also to Michael. And I'm going to return again to another quote. Um, it is complexity, not simplicity, that engages this particular student, Mariel Castillo. She can hook into information, remember it, and manipulate it for artistic purposes when it has context and interest. Again, we have a sort of a, a cultural narrative happening that's very present day. Um, whether we're doing Shakespeare, because we have still have to find the cultural currency of Shakespeare. Um, but if you would speak to that a little bit, too, because I think we're all, we're all in the same boat. No, we are. 
this book is a book of immersive nonfiction, which means that I went back to my hometown, which was a working class town, it is now a lower working class town, and went and revisited my teacher. We all have to have that one teacher who is influential to us. I think there's no one in this room, no one anywhere who's gotten anywhere that didn't have that one teacher. So this was my teacher, and, uh, but the trick was not to make this a love letter or not to make it sentimental, but to examine success. As a journalist, you, you often examine failure. I want to see what makes this man such a great teacher. Uh, and after I had left, many years after I left, you know, in this lower working class town, he created probably the best drama department or one of the best drama departments in America. And, you know, this is a town where you think, well, maybe you'll have a great football program, but, you know, never a great drama department. So this particular quote about Mariela Castillo, Mariela Castillo was um, a special education student because um, she had childhood leukemia, and the treatment she got as a three-year-old was thought to have destroyed part of her ability to, to hold on to large amounts of information. But lo and behold, in this very challenging drama department that New York goes to to say, can we put Rent on stage as a high school musical? Can we do uh, Les Mis? And Cameron McIntosh himself went to the school to see them do Les Mis. Marilyn Castillo could do drama. And she could do these really wordy, you know, long plays, and no problem because it had, you know, a narrative through line as, as Shakespeare does, as the Laramie Project does. It had stuff in it that, that not only was meaningful to her, but also was good and was challenging. And I think one of the things that I'm taking from both my colleagues here is that kids want difficult stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, they really want difficult stuff. They want meaty stuff. If you look at some of the plays that are done, you know, year after year after year, there's a list of them, you know, and I'm not including Shakespeare in this, obviously, but some of them are like really old and musty, and they don't relate to anybody's life. Well, you can't teach that because it's not, it's not interesting. So, uh, you know, so I wrote a book about a teacher. I wrote a book about a master teacher. And I think it's, it's particularly relevant right now because he's teaching stuff that isn't tested, uh, that, that, you know, isn't part of accountability. Um, but one of the things that I took out of this, and I, and I would take out of all the teaching of the arts, is that it was really concrete. You know, it was the most concrete. The arts are an airy term. You know, the arts. But, you know, you, you do a play, and you, you build a set, and you, and you work as a team, and you learn your lines, and you're held accountable. And for any student in this program, it was the most concrete thing they did. And for Mariella, as for many students, uh, it was not only the most concrete thing that she did, but it was the one thing that kept her, you know, feeling good about herself uh, in school, sort of really moving forward. So I'm really glad that you, that you picked that particular thing out because it's one of my favorite things in the book. Hmm. Can I just jump in on something? Please do. Please just do. the idea of, of students wanting to be challenged. One of the, uh, the best years of my artistic life was when the theater company, Tectonic Theater Project, um, received a grant to send company members to schools uh, that had their production of the Laramie Project banned. And you know, usually when a principal bans the Laramie Project, it really backfires on that principal <laughs> um, because it soon hits the papers that it's been banned. And very often, if you, the principal is asked in the press, "Well, have you read the play?" they sheepishly say no. Um, but going to these communities where once it was banned, the sense of oh, we knew we were doing something important, but now we really feel like we're doing something important, and the determination of those students to get those productions in their communities in spite of their schools. They would go to churches. They would go to different places in the community, and one production actually was rehearsing in the student's backyard, and I went to the backyard to help them with their staging of the Laramie Project. Mm -hmm. And it was really one of like the best uh, drama classes ever because they had they had brought all this heavy furniture into the backyard, and so they were trying to drag the the tables across the grass and everything. And I said, well, can we imagine maybe we don't need all this furniture? We could trust that the characters could just speak. 
And their eyes lit up like, oh, yeah, we don't need these tables. We, we have the characters. And then they would put long pauses between each scene. And I said, well, what if the character who's about to speak next comes walking in while the other one's speaking? And immediately this boy raised his hand. He said, but my drama teacher said, never move when someone else is speaking. <laughs> and I said, oh, OK, that's, that's a good note. But how would you move when someone else is speaking so as not to detract from the speaker? And so we had this incredible class you know, on the fly. But it was based on the fact that you know, their production had been banned and their, their determination to see that through and get that into their communities. You know, if I could add one thing to that, you talked about the furniture and making do, and I think this goes to theater, or obviously your teachers, you need materials, you need books, you, you need things. But still, uh, I think the ability to convince students that you don't need everything, Lou Volpe, who's, which is the name of the, the, my old teacher and the person who's a central character in this book, he always said to his students, he said, if all we had was a bare light, a bare light bulb and a, and a stage with nothing on it, we could still do theater. And the thing is, they believed him. So it struck me that one of the arts of teaching is to get your students to believe that, which I'm sure you all do. But you know, it was a great lesson to me that 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 you know that becomes part of the challenge. And this, they have more than a bed, they have more than a light bulb and a stage, but it's they didn't have much. More and more theater is being done that way. If you go to modern productions, there's so little set. You go to the Globe Theater in London, and it is simply the Globe Theater in London. They walk out on stage. There's no scenery whatsoever. They're done during the day. There's no lighting. So the fact of the matter is, that is what theater is. Theater is a couple boards and an audience. It's a lot less expensive than football. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and you know, in terms of relevance, so, so, so uh, uh, while Shakespeare can seem remote, so you go, oh my gosh, it's so highfalutin. Shakespeare is this big special thing. You know, it's, it's not. Think of the central stories that you can start out teaching. You know, I, I, everybody here who didn't raise their hands is not teaching it. My mission in life is going to be get you to teach some Shakespeare to the kids. Because, you know, look at, let's take the obvious ones, Romeo and Juliet. I mean, what could possibly be more relevant to the kids? You're a youngster. You fall desperately in love with, with a, 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 a beautiful human being who, who, who attracts you, and your parents are against it. <laughs> but that's what the story is. That is the story, right? Romeo is a Mont from the house of Montague. Uh, Juliet is from the house of Capulet. And they're not allowed to mingle with each other. They're feuding. They're at war. They're having street, they're street gangs against each other. They hate each other. So these two people from different worlds fall in love with each other. That is one of the <laughs> great motifs and tropes of all, I mean, I'm sure you see it in all the plays of all times, which is, you see it again and again in every theater piece you can almost ever think of, which is the older generation standing in the way of the sexual urge of the younger generation. That is 90% of the literature we read. <laughs> it's in there. And that's part of it. And the, so these stories, like Romeo and Juliet, it's not the only one. If you take, um, oh, you take Twelfth Night. Twelfth Night is about the love of a brother and sister. So say, Romeo and Juliet, you're teaching kids. You're teaching them about love between uh, a, 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 a sexual love, a, attractive love, be it girl, girl, boy, 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 girl, whatever it is. In Twelfth Night, a brother, sister. In the later plays, all four romances, fathers and daughters. So there's, the, there, there's these these absolutely deeply relevant stories that are the base stories, of, they're, the, they're the mythic stories of our existence. You've got to teach your kids some of this. We have the, we did, no, please, please, <laughs> please. We have this relativity question that comes up all the time, I know, with Shakespeare. Um, and, and we almost have a perspective of over-relativity when we're bringing in hot-button political social issues. We started to talk about this, I want, before we leave it, challenges. You began to talk about what are some of the challenges to getting these types of programs, these ki this kind of material done in our programs. And secondly, and I think this has some bearing on it as well, changes. What's changed in the 25, 20, 15, maybe a little longer for me, uh, years since I was in school, things have changed. Um, even in the past 10 years, when I was teaching in one place and then I taught last year, I found socially the kids were different than they were, obviously, than they used to be. What advice would you give 
an army of teachers who want to overcome some of these challenges? The first thing I would say is that it's really difficult because a high school, the official part of a high school, is so much more prudish than primetime TV <laughs> or, or the hallways. So you're in a, you know, you're in an environment that, that's really, really difficult where people, uh, your, your superiors strive not to offend and it's almost impossible to ever teach anybody anything without being a little bit offensive or, or being a little bit controversial. So, you know, Ken was just saying about Romeo and Juliet, I mean, what are, what are teenagers interested in? They're interested in sex, suppressed sexuality, I mean, they're consumed with, with when it's going to all happen for them and, you know, what it is and all that. So that's like the great stuff of literature. So in Levittown, Pennsylvania, which is a socially conservative um, community, it's full of what used to be called Reagan Democrats, um, one of Lou's last plays was Spring Awakening. Well, mm, you know, I, I don't think that's going to work in most places, but the fact is rent doesn't work in most places. I guess I would ask you, and I would ask you guys, I don't, I'm not sure what the solution is. I mean, I know that when Lou did these plays, I think it's super important. You have to teach stuff that's, that's relevant, whether it's Shakespeare or whether it's the Laramie Project. I mean, all, we know what kids are interested in, mm -hmm. and we know what they're not interested in, and there's so much pressure to teach, especially in the arts. I mean, in chemistry, you wouldn't teach chemistry without, without DNA or biology or whatever, yeah, but, periodic. you know, it's okay with the arts. You, you, if you step back, uh, 60 years, it's great, you know? So, I mean, I think the thing is to find a middle ground where it's, it's tasteful, uh, to make a really strong argument that this has to be done, to draw on other um, communities that have done it, to say, look, if you don't do this, you're gonna look like an ass, basically, because the newspaper is gonna, is gonna come here and report on, on what a fossil you are as a principal. I mean, I, I would use, <laughs> like, everything you can. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wonderful. I mean, you know what's interesting to me about the Laramie Project? We also did Laramie 10 years later, and we, did, we performed the plays and rep at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And I was very struck because I keep waiting. It's been 16 years since Matthew Shepard died. It was actually October 12th, ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 16 years ago. And it's not historical. It still feels like it could have happened yesterday. And I keep waiting for the moment where it, it feels not as relevant, that it shouldn't be as shouldn't relevant, be. because the young people are so far ahead of the older generations on so, many, on so many of these issues. But I think that when teachers bring that material to the students, surprising things come out. I was invited to uh, a production in Pennsylvania, this Catholic school. And the person contacted me and said, we don't have any money, but it's a Catholic school, and it's such a big deal that we're doing this. You have mm -hmm. to come. And I went to Catholic school my whole life, and so I went. And I watched the production uh, that night. And, you know, in the Larry Project, there are people who are very uh, homophobic and make very grotesque uh, anti-gay remarks. And all of those were left in the play. And then any character who was openly gay, they edited it out. <laughs> so whenever anybody said, I'm gay and I live in Laramie, they would just say, I live in Laramie. <laughs> and, you know, I was so struck by this that, well, A, that, that I wouldn't notice because it's where I wrote the play, but B, <laughs> like, that you, that you would leave, that, leave in the homophobia and take out the people who are trying to be gay. And so I went to the person after and I said, oh, well, you're a very nice production, but I did notice that, <laughs> you know, nobody's allowed to be gay in your production. And he said, I know. That's, it was so troubling. But the students were afraid that if they were gay in the play, that people would think they were gay in, in real life, and they would have bad things happen to them at this college. I mean, that, you could teach that. You could teach just from that moment for the rest of their time in college, right? So we ended up having a dialogue about that, about other things that they could do in, in, in their campus community so that they didn't th not only feel afraid to be gay, but feel afraid to portray a gay person. You know, that's very, very deep, you know, entrenched homophobia that, that they felt even, you know, one step removed. So my point is that there are teaching moments that arise mm. when, when students are giving material that may, maybe are surprising. Not there on, at the beginning, but there at the end. 
you think there's, so? There's a moment that is just, I just have to throw this back in because it's your moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in Michael's book, there's a chapter called, It's a Play, Dude. <laughs> when his lead character is playing a gay character and some of the other guys are like, what, are you gay now? And he goes, it's a play, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and the amount of courage, I thought, and empowerment that it could take to do that, to come out and say, it's a play, dude, seemed to derive from his participation itself in the theater program. It gave him that ability to say that. Yes, I mean, uh, I guess part of that is just literacy. I mean, it's a play. Mm -hmm. And to, for anyone of his, you know, of any of his, his kids, out, his, his, his mates out in the crowd, to sort of equate those things is, is an, among other things, an illiteracy about, the, right. about drama. So, but there was a funny line, though. Oh, it's, it's a great <laughs> chapter header. I love yeah. that. Literacy about drama is really in a sense, we're the drama panel, so we're not the general literature panel. So that's exactly what we're here talking about. That's what all this is about, is, get, is giving the kids a real basic literacy, you've hit the nail on the head, a literacy about drama, that it's, that it's an art form, that the way it works is this, that the actors, look, it's remarkable the extent to which grown people could go to plays who are just, because they're not, it's not a criticism of, the, of them, but they've not had book learning, and they go to plays and they think that, uh, I've had this myself, I'm a playwright, is what I do. And, and that they say, gee, they're making up the actors, are, they think they're making up the lines as they're going. I know that sounds ridiculous, but if, you're, if you don't have a basic literacy of what the drama is about, that there is a playwright, that there are costume designers, that you're not the same as the person who's up there. Uh, I'm on the board of governors of the uh, uh, Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C., which is the greatest repository of Shakespeare materials in the world. And we had a speaker the other night. We, as the board, had a speaker. We teach, by the way, everybody here should, can, can apply to this. We, we give a seminar teaching high school teachers how to teach Shakespeare. It lasts for four weeks in the summer. It's, once you win it, I think it's entirely paid for. They were, uh, and this has been going on for about 15 years. You go to Washington, you spend four weeks with people. I always lecture at this and talk to the teachers at, at length. One of the teachers came back from having gone last year, and she said, here's what she did with her kids. The first, after having learned about Shakespeare and teaching Shakespeare, this year, because it's just September, she, the kids, and they were like 10-year-olds, came in the first day. The principal, and actually, the, the, the head of the school district uh, 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 of the Washington, of Washington, the school district of Washington, and the mayor of Washington dropped in on that s class. And what the kids were doing, she had taught them, was to memorize a little Shakespeare at the begin beginning. And it was all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. And each kid had that much to learn, and they had swords, and they had this, and they were, and they were playing different pe people, and they were getting, they were learning a, li a theater literature. Right. What the theater is about. Yeah. I I definitely don't want us to run out of time before we get to this thing because we're creeping up on the shores of empathy. And as you know, this is National Bullying Month, October. Um, something I'm sure you have to grapple with in schools, big city schools. Um, but I think, like I said, we're we're just crawling up to the shore of this particular topic, which I'd like to sort of kick us now up, right up onto the shore. Um, and I'm sure you can take us into that, <laughs> Lee. Um, walking in another human being's shoes, learning their thoughts, their languages. Yeah, what have I, you seen in terms of practical use, what, benefits, and what outcomes? I've, what I've seen is, well, we talk about the empathy of the actor as being the genesis of the Laramie Project. Um, we didn't go to Laramie saying that we were going to write a play about what happened to Matthew Shepard. We went to Laramie with a question, here's this watershed moment in America, here's the first time CNN and MSNBC and all the major news stations are covering a hate crime, an anti-gay hate crime. This is the first time in history anything like this. Do we have, as theater artists have a role to play? And so 10 of us went down there with that question, do we have a role to play? And we arrived right at the moment, it was about three weeks after Matthew died, when the media was leaving Laramie. And the people were, of Laramie were very hurt by how the media had portrayed them as, you know, rednecks and cowboys and really homophobic and, you know, found, found the roughest looking cowboy on the street and stuck a microphone in their face. And they said, no, that's not how it is here. 
And we said, okay, so if that's not how it is here, how is it here? And they began to just talk to us for hours and hours and hours and hours. So when then we came back to New York, all that information that the actors received, the filter of their own empathy was there. So even if they disagreed with someone, if you disagree with someone, you could even think their thoughts or their words are abhorrent. If they're sitting a foot away from you in a conversation, that changes your relationship to what they're saying and to them as, as a person. And so the Laramie Project was really constructed in part from that, that empathy. And I think that as it's gone on to have a life, which we never anticipated ever, because the actors are characters, so we all thought the actors would perform it and then it would be over. So the fact that you know, students have gone on to do it is, is very surprising to us. But I think that you know, a, a student taking on Fred Phelps as a character or you know, stepping into the shoes of someone whose, whose experiences are very, very different from them, it, it, is the, it is that bridge. And I guess I would call it like the empathy that's readily available and then the empathy that you have to earn. And I think when they, when they portray people mm -hmm. who have really different views than them, they have, to earn, they have to earn it. They have to say, OK, if I'm really going to be good at my acting, I have to really embody this person. And then I think through that process, they, they kind of earn that, that openness about somebody else's perspective. Hmm. I guess what I would add is that uh, I was very much a visitor in the world I was writing about. I was not in my teacher's theater program, which was very young at the time, I, was, I played sports. Uh, and then what I wrote in the book uh, at a certain point is that, first of all, there was no crossover at that time between a, a boy who played sports and a boy who did theater. It just, there was a, you know, a bridge and you didn't cross it. Um, so I wrote at one point that you know, in sports, your inner life is, is not welcome, your emotions are not welcome, your ability to, to sort of be in touch with, with something deep is is very unwelcome. So when I went and I wrote this book, I, that's what I saw. And I saw the value of boys in, in particular, because it was unfamiliar to me, but this whole group that, that could see life through somebody else's eyes because, because they were acting it. And there was a young man uh, named Wayne Mileto, one of the best actors, you know, were, you know, all kinds of awards. And he was actually told, look, he's a young African-American boy, he looked very different than, than, than uh, what was out there in a lot of the professional world, even if it was just to make commercials at first or whatever. But he was told, you can, you know, you can go right into this business. There's, there's work for you. you know, go. And he didn't. He, he went to Temple University and to study law enforcement. And at first I thought, oh, Wayne, come on, man. You can be, you can be an actor. You, you, know, you can take this further. And I thought, well, this is pretty great. He's going to be out in the streets, and he has a theater background. And mm. it would probably be a pretty different world if all our law enforcement people had a few semesters of, <laughs> of theater. So, um, wow. you know, so you learn all kinds of things. And I saw this, and it was, it was new to me. And it, and it, was, you know, it was a way of seeing the value of, of what's going on. Because obviously, when we teach kids the arts, uh, any of the arts, we're, we're not expecting that they're necessarily going to make a living in the arts, but, but but we get these other things out of it, and empathy, which is you know encompasses all kinds of things, is a, is a huge part of it. Do you have anything you might want to add? I think that's so well said. Uh, I don't know that I do, uh, other than the fact that that's what theater is all about. When you go to see drama, you're seeing things from different points of view all the time. I mean, just take the great line from uh, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream that Puck says, Lord, what fools these mortals be, when he's watched a whole scene you know, unfold in front of him. His perspective is he, he has a, an empathy for these humans, these human things that he doesn't understand. That, that, so theater is constantly looking at things from all different angles. That's what its value is. So when you do this fantastic Laramie project, which is so fantastically great, uh, uh, I must say, uh, I've seen it again and again, I adore it, is you look at all those viewpoints that you're talking about, empathy, that you're digging out and unearthing. That's what theater is. That's what, that's what theater is about. And that's why I'm saying start them with Shakespeare, but start them someplace and get them to become, become drama literate. Hmm. Um, we have about four minutes left, um, and there's some greatness on the stage, and I'm sure you probably have questions. Please, questions? that you might want to direct to one of the panelists? Or a comment? <laughs> yes. Um, I teach drama at the college level. I'm a Shakespearean scholar. 
one here, of the here. things that open up Shakespeare to young people, from my own perspective, is centering them in yesteryear and today. So if you can link both what happened during the Renaissance to something that's happening currently, mm -hmm. students sit up and they listen because they want to know well, how could way back then have anything to do with now? And I, I, I would say to them, nothing is new. You know, it just comes in a different package or in a different form. And I take them back and bring them forward. And by the by mid semester, I have Shakespeare and Scholar too. Mm -hmm. right. Wonderful. Brava. 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 Can I say a hand over there? Yes, please. Right. Uh, girls, roles, girls are playing boys' roles. The girls had no problem playing boys' roles. The boys, however, really balked. And it was a huge problem for me to convince. And once we got through the production, the rehearsal production, they were fine. But I'm wondering if there is something that we as teachers can do to demystify this notion that roles are acting, that it is okay for boys to step in. Well, in terms of Shakespeare, of course, during Shakespeare's time, there were no women actors. So first of all, the, all those parts of women were, in fact, played by men. And men, and, and, and of course, I'm sure, what, what, grade, what grade are your kids? So this is six through 10. Because there is that period where you go, oh my god, will they think I'm gay? Will they think <laughs> this? Will I think I'm that? But you know, if, if you can get them to, to get a little more dignity than that and, and get into their humanity and say, well, look, what's fun is these were played. And Shakespeare's plays are full of cross-dressing. Six of Shakespeare's plays d do women who play men, Viola, Rosalind, etc. And there's some the other way where men play women's roles. Falstaff dresses up as, uh, as the Witch of Brentford. So, 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 I don't know, get them into the spirit. And I was just in uh, Stratford, Ontario this summer. They were doing Crazy for You, the musical I wrote, but they were doing, of course, all their other great Shakespeare plays. And they did King, uh, they did the Midsummer, they did King Lear, but also did Midsummer. And in Midsummer, they had Hippolyta played by a male actor. Now, that's just because shaking up the gender roles made everything more interesting. Uh, not Hippolyta, I mean, um, uh, Helena, excuse me. It's a challenge. I think we have time for one last question. Yes, maybe two. <laughs> For Ken? Uh, yes, for Ken. Um, I was wondering, um, I've used um, Shakespeare Set Free and some of the many of the other resources that we use through the Folger Library, et cetera, and you probably know a lot of our colleagues anyway, uh, Michael LaMonaco and, and Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. And so I was wondering, how, how does your book complement some of the resources that we're all, that we're using in the classrooms now? Uh, Thank you. She's, uh, if can anybody hear this uh, question? She said, she said uh, Folger Shakespeare Library has a lot of resources. A group called, thing called Shakespeare Set Free, which is uh, by play. It's yeah. a lot of things, but play by play. And there's other resources. How does this book differ? This book differs in the sense that it's kind of a primer. It's the beginning place to start. It starts out with one line. Uh, 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 um, uh, I know a bank where the wild time blows. Teach your kids that. Teach them how to say those eight syllables. Just teach them that and then go to the second line and it, it's a way to start from absolutely ground zero with youngsters and they're not, there is nothing else. So I've been teaching at the Shakespeare, at the Folger a lot with this book. Peggy O'Brien is the head of education. I was just with her last night and, and, and they're using this book a lot because it's a way to start from the beginning that isn't just one play. It's not too hard to start with. It's kind of easy way to ease yourself into learning it. Then go to Shakespeare Set Free for Twelfth Night or Midsummer. Then go to, uh, uh, you know, the great scholars. On the board with me is Jim Shapiro, who wrote 1599, mm -hmm. you know, and is now doing a new one. And, and, and start, start with what's easy for the kids. Mm. Thank you so much, and a hand, I don't even have to ask for it. Thank you all three of you so much, Lee and Michael and Ken. Thank you. I'm sure you will be able to talk with them later um, after the event when we've got authors in the back. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another round of applause for our drama panel, please. <laughs>